Well, glory. That's about as good it gets right there, isn't it? Rock of ages. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And uh, Dr. Jimmy Gentry, thank you and your family for being here. What a joy it is to have your family in our church family here at Midway and uh, have you baptized and your granddaughter. What a special moment. Um, also uh, had a unique celebration as a believer yesterday. I found out that uh, the man who was preaching the night I gave my life to Jesus at the age of eight went to be with the Lord Jesus. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Sammy Allen, and he could quote the New Testament. And I remember I was uh, eight years old, and he was preaching an evangelistic crusade at the Bremen High School gymnasium, and I gave my life to Jesus there that night, and just saw yesterday on Facebook, he went to be with the Lord. My father bought a, a sermon on album, and for you young people, it's a plastic round thing that you used to could put on an old record player, and it had one sermon on it by Sammy Allen, and I guess I've heard it a hundred times in my lifetime. And it was simply called, What Time Is It? And he, he said it was uh, preaching time, and it was praying time, and it was proving time, and it was praising time. That, that's, that's, good, that's a good outline there. And, and, and for him, it's now praising time. He's gone to be with the Lord Jesus, and I thank God for his influence. And it's just a reminder that none of us get to where we are on our own. God, for some reason, has chosen to use people to influence people, to use ordinary people as his tools to share the gospel of Christ, and uh, it's always a joy to open up God's word. I want to thank you folks for joining us online, at home, or on vacation, wherever you are, and for those of you who are in the room, really grateful every week that you choose to be here with your Bibles open, or you choose to be in your living room with your Bibles open as we study God's word together. And it's about intentionality. I say this regularly, and it can't be said too often, that good and better doesn't chase you down and jump on you and help you. It just doesn't. Bad and worse will chase you down. It's always nipping at your heels. Doesn't matter whether it's in your business, in your marriage, in your personal life, as a father or mother or a grandparent or, or whether it's as a friend, doesn't matter. Any relationship, anything that you and I are doing or endeavor, bad and worse are always after you, always nipping at you, always chasing you, and good and better, you're going to have to run after them and chase them and it being intentional about your spiritual journey is one way of doing that. Uh, so just glad that you're here and... I want to ask you to open up your Bible to the back part of your Bible, 1 John. There's uh, 1, 2, and 3 John, or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, just before you get to the book of Jude and then Revelation. So we're in the latter portion of your Bibles. You can find it uh, very easily and jump in there with me. I hope you've had a great week. I know you've had a great week if you did what I asked you to do this week. If you paid attention last Sunday... I challenge you to read through these five chapters every week as we teach through this book. We're simply calling this series Light and Love. Be the light, show the love. Over and over throughout this passage, you're going to find some component about light and love and the fact that God is light, God is love, and as we live out our lives, we are that light and we are that love. And so we're to, we're to intentionally invest that light and love in the people we come in contact with. But I challenged you last week that on Monday, read chapter... All right. On Tuesday, read chapter... And Wednesday and Thursday... And Friday, don't get weak on me, five, all right, five chapters. Now, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing this week. On Monday, chapter one, and Tuesday, two, right on through to Friday, chapter five. And if we do that throughout this study, I think it's about 13 weeks, you're going to know what First John has to say. Now, the reason many of us don't know the Word of God is because we don't ever read it especially consecutively over and over again. But it's going to be interesting as you read these texts how much jumps off the page into your own life, into your own soul, and you begin to apply into your life. So today I want to talk about something that, is, that we really know a little too much about. I want to talk to you on the subject, what about sin in the life of a Christian? Well, what about it? 
What about sin in the life of a Christian? I have met people who would say that I met a man one time and said he didn't, didn't remember ever sinning. He, he, I just don't think he understood quite the concept of sin. And I've met people who feel like that every time they sin, they need to give their life to Jesus again. They have to get saved again. Some feel like they need to get baptized again. Some feel like once they've sinned, they can't ever come to church again. They feel embarrassed. They're shamed. They just don't feel like they can walk in these doors. Pastor, I used to be right with God, but I, I got off into this, that, or the other, and I, I feel like if I walked in the building, I've had it said many, many times, if I walk in, I'm afraid the building would fall in on me. I, I think many of us have felt that way perhaps a time or two. I, I, I've also said this about me in my own personal life. Knowing I have to preach on Sunday is a great motivator for me to deal with my sin. That's why it's very important for you to find a way to serve. It will help you be a better follower of Christ to know that you're, you're serving and have that example that you're to for, supposed to put forth for other people. So in this particular text, we're going to begin reading in chapter 1 and verse 6. And so I, I want to enter into this text highlighting one of the key reasons why the Apostle John said he wrote this book. And we find it in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. He said, my little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. One of the key purposes for which he wrote this book was to help you and me not sin. I went through a list of reasons why he wrote this book last Sunday. One of them was so that you might know that you have eternal life, not hope, but know that you have eternal life. Another one is that you might not be deceived. And, and, and all of those he specifies, but here's one of those key phrases and purposes. I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. So with that as a background, I want to begin reading in verse 6 and look at it with me. You ready for the word? Say, I am. All right, verse 6. He said, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And here's that text. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the, and here's a big theological term. You won't read this probably anywhere else but in the Bible. He himself is the propitiation, propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Father, I pray your blessing upon the reading of this word, upon the teaching of it, upon those of us who are listening to it. May you apply it to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In this text, there is clear evidence that as someone still in this world, you and I have the capacity, the ability to sin. Even as a Christian, even as a follower of Jesus Christ, totally sold out to him, we have that capacity. Until the day we die, we live in a sinful world, we're constantly tempted by sin, and we have the ability, we have the capacity to say yes still within us, even though we're followers of Christ. Now, I think most all of us would agree to that. Most all of us have dealt with that enough if we're intellectually honest and spiritually honest to know that even as a follower of Christ, there have been times since we gave our heart and life to Christ that we were tempted to sin and instead of running and turning and saying no, instead we said yes and we allowed sin to creep into our life. Now, it may not have been some 
overt type sin. It may have been a covert type sin. It may have been something that we simply omitted from our life. It may have been that we were not obedient as we should. We may not have had an affair. We may not have intentionally lied, but we bent the truth a little bit, which is a lie, by the way. And we didn't go into something and develop some big massive scheme, but we were sort of caught and we just sort of let it out and we lied because it felt or seemed easier than telling the truth. We are aware that we have the capacity and the ability to sin even though we are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to throw out something else. Based upon this text, we also have the capacity and the ability to not sin. Which many of us struggle with a little, a, a little more deeply because most of us know us. <laughs> most of us look at ourselves in the mirror. Most of us deal with our own life. We go to bed with ourselves at night and we wonder, is there a capacity? Is there ability? Is there the possibility of me living through a day and not sin? The Apostle John said, the very reason I gave you this book is to help you not sin, that you might not sin, meaning there is the ability or the capacity for us to not sin. Now, so let's talk about what what does it mean when a believer sins? What do we do regarding sin? How do we address sin when it crops up in a believer's life? I want to deal with three specific things that the Apostle John addresses here in this text. Number one, he addresses the issue of honesty versus lying about our sin. He addresses that very clearly. Matter of fact, in verse 6, I I love the way he enters this conversation. He says, if we say, and he gives a quote, we have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we're lying and are not practicing the truth. I underline that phrase, if we say, if we say, if we say. Because in verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 8, once again he says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then in verse 10, once again he says, if we say, and he goes on to say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So three specific times he throws out this suggestive thought, if we say, if we say, if we say, as if to propose that it could be that not everything we say is true. He's dealing with the issue of honesty and talking about sin. Matter of fact, he highlights three key areas here. In in verse 6, if we say, and he goes on to say, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we're lying and are not practicing the truth. He's really talking about the persona you and I put on with other people. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, we'll get in the habit of lying to other people. I'm not talking about intentionally telling a story about a fish or a, or a, a sail or something like that. I'm just talking about even about ourselves, about our own spiritual journeys. We'll put on a persona as churchgoers that will give people the idea that no, I don't know why you deal with that because I never do deal with that. I don't ever battle with that. I don't have that, that kind of struggle. Everything seems okay to me. And I think that's oftentimes one of the great challenges of people outside the family of faith, looking inside the family of faith, the people who are inside act as if sometimes they don't struggle with these issues and those outside the family of faith are more honest about those things than sometimes we are. And we give a false understanding or a false perception and we literally are in the process of trying to deceive other people talking about their sins, oftentimes ignoring our own. And if we say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, that word walk is that consistent process whereby you and I are living out our lives before other people. That's where we bring in others. If we walk in darkness, if we're living in darkness in front of them and yet we say we don't have sin, we're walking the light, he says, actually, no, we're, we're lying. So sometimes we get caught in the process of lying to others. But in verse 8, when he says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. So not only do we get caught in the process of deceiving and lying to other people, but we get caught in the process of then deceiving ourselves. Have you ever been there? Do you you talk to yourself? I often say, be careful what you say because everything you say speaks loudest to you. 
And the moment you and I begin to justify our actions or justify our behaviors or justify attitudes that we have that we know are sin and the Bible clearly depicts as sin and describes as sin in Scripture, the moment we begin to have that self-conversation and justify that to someone else, we've entered into a process of self-deception. And we start using phrases like, well, I know what the Bible says, but I feel. We start talking about how we feel. My wife doesn't make me feel this way, or my husband doesn't make me feel this way, or this business deal just feels like it's at the right time. I know it's shady. I know I could get caught. I know I could get sent off and serve prison time, but it's coming at an opportune time, and I just feel that's self-talk that's destructive and dangerous and deceptive. And the moment we begin telling ourselves such, we're not only now lying to others, we're lying to ourselves. And self-deception is sometimes the hardest to move through. And then he says in verse 10, if we, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. So the first, if we say, is about lying to others. The second, if we say in verse 8, is about lying to ourselves. But the third, if we say, is about lying to God. You see how progressive it is? There's a progression to lying about our sin. So the Apostle John just says, be honest. If you've got it, got it. Admit it, acknowledge it, and begin to move forward. Be honest about your sin. Don't justify those actions. It'll preserve your life and sometimes your marriage and sometimes your stability and integrity in life. You have the capacity to be honest. Regarding every sin, you have the capacity to be honest. You also have the capacity in every sin to lie about it and try to cover it up. That leads me to the second. He not only addresses the issue of honesty and lying about our sin, he addresses the issue of confessing versus covering our sin. Confessing versus covering our sin. It's found in verse 9. He said, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, let's talk a little bit about confession. There are several uh, components or, or, or different ideas about confession today. If I use the word confession, if you come from a, a Catholic background, it's likely that your mind will go back to a confession booth or speaking to a priest about something and having sins absolved. If you come up from other faith traditions, in some cases you might find that you never were taught about confessing at all, that you didn't have to confess because you're forgiven. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. It's over and done. There's no need to confess. In other faith traditions, it's likely you might have had the, the background or teaching that you must confess your sins every day or you didn't have a relationship with God, and if you died without having confessed those sins, you wouldn't go to heaven. There are numerous concepts about confession. The Bible speaks much about confession. Confess itself means to say the same thing about. To say the same thing about. Or to say the truth about something. Now, in this text, Scripture's used a, a metaphor. He says that God is light. We studied last week, that's also another way of saying God is truth. Because if you shine truth on something, we say, I, I can't understand this. I need some light shined on this. We use that metaphorically in a couple of ways. It's like shining truth. You know the truth, and the truth shall do what? It shall set you free. And so when you shine light on something, you're no longer in the darkness when you're, you're walking in truth. So truth, truth that we learn from God and learn from God's word is what we're to build our lives on and every component of our life and every transaction of our life is to be centered in God's truth. To confess means that we're acknowledging and confessing that something about our life does not align with God's truth. We're not trying to justify that. We're not trying to say it's okay and I can leave it that way. We're acknowledging God says this is wrong or God says this is right. 
and I'm trying to align my life in line with God's truth. I, I want to walk in the light. I want to walk in the truth. And so as I learn truth, I'm aligning my actions, my behaviors, and my attitudes with God's word and with God's truth and with God's light. And confession means there's something inside of me that's not there. And I acknowledge it's not there. And I, I, I understand that I've got to get that fixed in my life and move and transfer and transition my life from this action or attitude or behavior of darkness and align that with an action, attitude, or behavior of light which is established by God himself. So to confess simply means to say the truth about it. Confession is about intentionally walking in the light or intentionally walking in the truth. It's about being honest with yourself, honest with others, honest with God. It's more than simply admitting my sin, but it's about adequately judging my sin myself and facing it honestly to say what God says about it. That's what confession is, to confess. Y'all all right, still awake? So, confess. We have that option every time we sin as a believer. I can confess that sin. <clears throat> I know I lied. I know my lie is wrong. That's a part of walking in darkness. I've got to correct my behavior. And if you find yourself in a habit of lying, which sometimes... Christians do because I've had transactions with believers that lied regularly. You may have had transactions with me and you felt like I lied. I hope I didn't, but I, I, I could have lied to you before. Lying is one of the easiest things in the world, is it not? <laughs> Gets us out of so much for a moment. Uh, I, I won't ever forget as a kid. We lived between two big truck stops on Highway 78. Lily's truck stop, ABC truck stop. Those big semi-trucks would park in this big dirt parking area while they're eating a meal and stopping to rest. And there was a large hill beside that. And I won't ever forget in about, I, don't, I was probably second grade maybe, seven years old or so. My brothers and I were playing on top of that hill and I stepped on a snake. And it was a small snake, but when you're seven years old, every snake's a big snake. And I don't even remember what happened to that snake. But I remember stepping on that snake, and I do remember I had on long pants, and it, I stepped on it on the end, and it went up my pants leg and was wiggling on my leg, okay? And I, that's probably why I don't remember what happened to it, because I probably left there. And that was over a weekend. By the time I got to school on Monday, <laughs> and I told about that snake, I, I had stepped on that snake, and it had ran up my pants leg, and I reared back. That's a West Georgia term. I reared back, and I kicked as hard as I could, and it slung that snake out on top of one of those big semi-trucks. And the sun was shining so hot that when it hit the top of that truck, it just, psh, it just sizzled and died right there, just froze on top of that truck. And I wondered what state it was in now on the back of that truck. And the more I told that and people would go, kids would go, oh, isn't that all we need sometimes? Oh, wow. And we can't hardly wait to tell it again. It was years that went by before I had to acknowledge and I had to confess. <laughs> you know, that didn't even happen. You ever had stuff like that? You told as a kid as a story and it got so good, it followed you into adulthood. And after one day, you awaken and you said, I need to quit telling that. That just simply isn't true. Yeah, it can happen, doesn't matter who you are. Confessing. We have the option of either confessing or covering, confessing or covering. Now, what's our natural tendency? Even as followers of Christ, what's our natural tendency? Confess or cover? Cover. cover. It's also part of our sinful nature. We want to cover and hide our sin. But Proverbs 29, or 28 and verse 13 says this. He says, the one who conceals or covers his sins will not prosper. 
But whoever confesses and renounces or forsakes them will find mercy. Now, that's good advice. The advice there is not just if, but when you sin, don't cover it up. Just confess it. You'll find mercy. But if you try to cover it, there's no mercy to be found. You've chosen a different route than what God has established. And so confession is so vital and so important in addressing sin in the life of a believer. Psalm 51 and verse 10 says, the, the psalmist prayed, David prayed, God created me a, a, a clean heart. Created me a clean heart. And even as followers of Christ, we sometimes have to pray that prayer. If we get off into sin, stay there any period of time, we have to come back to a point of, of a contrite spirit, of being a contrite spirit and calling upon God and saying, God, restore me, forgive me, do something in my life, cleanse my life, renew that right fellowship and spirit within me. So he addresses the issue of honesty versus lying about our sin. He addresses the issue of confessing versus covering our sin. And number three, he addresses in this text the issue of help and hope. Of help and hope. As a Christian, when we sin, there is that voice inside of us that says, There's no help for you. There is that voice. And there's also that voice down inside that says, There's no hope for you. And yet, in this text, the Apostle John addresses both of those things. There is both help and there is hope for the Christian who sins. I'll reiterate in this verse, verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, I wrote this that you may not sin. I was doing a little reading and looking at comparison verses in Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, just as a reminder that as believers, he says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its desires. So, A life without sin is something we should aspire to every day. In Baptist culture and Baptist life, I have had people who almost worked to justify actions, wrong actions, by saying, well, you know, Pastor, you know, we're going to sin every day. (laughs) You're going to sin every day. I I feel like some people sort of lean into that a little bit too much. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) You know, you know, none of us are perfect. We're just gonna we're gonna sin every day. So let me just go ahead and get a dab of that right over there. Let me go on over here and tell that over here. You you didn't know none of us are perfect. We're gonna we're gonna sin. We're gonna mess up every day. He said, I wrote this so that you wouldn't live that way. That as followers of Jesus Christ, you are not to allow sin to reign in your mortal bodies. There should be, as a follower of Christ, if you've been born again, the Spirit of God lives on the inside. There should be some voice inside of you that, that resists that, that, that wants to drive you toward living a life without sin. I oftentimes have said that if, it, if you can sin and it does not bother you, that ought to really bother you. <laughs> if you can sin and it doesn't bother you, That ought to really bother you. On the other hand, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have sinned, there is a remedy, there is a process to deal with that sin, and you also don't have to beat yourself up every day about that sin. So how do you find this hope and this help? Two things. First of all, there's help through what he calls an advocate, an advocate. In verse 1, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Help through an advocate, advocate. Unless you're in some type of legal field, you don't use the word advocate that often. Advocate, it's a legal term. In this case, it comes from the Greek word parakletos. It means one who walks alongside as a helper or comforter. Same word that in other cases is translated as Holy Spirit. 
because he is our comforter, our helper in time of need. But in this case, regarding sin, if the believer sins, he says we have a helper, an advocate who helps us, who comforts us, who walks alongside us in this case. We are not alone. Jesus Christ is our advocate, much like an attorney is the advocate even for someone who is guilty of sin. They are not walking through the court system alone, but they have an advocate who will stand before the judge and will plead their case and compare their case with other cases and other individuals. We have a spiritual advocate who stands before the Heavenly Father and pleads our case. We are not standing before God on our own. You are not standing before God on your own goodness, on your own merit. You are not guilty or innocent because you are guilty or innocent. (laughs) Your entire platform for standing before God is not upon you at all. It's all upon Jesus Christ. And he is a perfect Advocate, you say, what does he know about sin? I'm glad you asked. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, says that he can be the perfect advocate, our perfect high priest. He can sympathize with our weaknesses is what the text says. He can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted, yet without sin. He is the perfect advocate. To walk alongside us. And though no one else know anything that you've done wrong, you have an advocate with the Father. And you can go to the advocate and he can plead your case and he stands before the Father as the perfect one, righteous, and he ultimately will simply say, Father, he's with me. She's with me. The liar is with me. The adulterer or adulteress is with me. The shyster is with me. The person who's failed and failed and failed over here, they're with me. And I don't stand right before God upon my own goodness or because I'm the pastor of Midway Church or I got baptized or because I'm a Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or charismatic or whatever the title or brand may be. I stand right before God because Jesus Christ himself was tempted in every way that you and I are tempted and yet without sin. And he stands perfectly righteous before God and I'm with him. Okay? That's the essence of our salvation. In case you had not figured it out yet, you won't ever get good enough. Uh, I've, I've shared the story over and over again about when I was in middle school, some guys and I, we decided that we were going to quit cursing in West Georgia, cussing, okay? And we made this pact that if any one of us cursed, then everybody in our friendship group could take their middle knuckle and take turns and go around and hit that person on the arm as hard as they could. Well, after about a week, we couldn't pick up our arms. <laughs> we, our arms are just, just virtually dead. They're black and blue. I think you get the idea that sometimes all of our efforts, all of our self-efforts are still never going to lead us to perfection. But we stand before God relationally, positionally, as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. Because God doesn't accept anything less than perfection. That's why you need a Savior. (laughs) Not a good one, but a perfect one. There's another word that he uses here, and it's where we get our hope. Our help comes through an advocate. But secondly, we have hope through this big theological word, propitiation. Propitiation. The word propitiation can be interpreted as appeasement. Or satisfaction. The mercy seat throughout the Old Testament, whereby the blood was sprinkled on top of the mercy seat, that's where propitiation took place. And underneath the mercy seat was in in the 
the Ark of the Covenant was the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God with the people, the mercy seat there, and then you had the sins of the people out here. And when the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the mercy seat, it was the blood that was standing between the presence of God, the judgment of God, the perfection of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God, and the wrath of God. It was the blood, the death, the sacrifice of an animal. Blood sprinkled the lamb that kept the wrath of God away from the people. Propitiation, Jesus Christ is now the propitiation for our sins. Now, here's what that means. That doesn't mean that our sin, that it's okay in the eyes of God. <laughs> you need to understand this theologically. It doesn't mean our sin's okay in the eyes of God. It doesn't mean that God winks at our sin and we can keep on living in our sin. It's not a, not a big deal. It's not a big issue for us to allow sin to take root in our life. You can't find that anywhere in Scripture. It's always a big deal. As a matter of fact, it's such a big deal that Jesus Christ became the propitiation. God appeased His justice. God satisfied His judgment. God appeased His wrath against sin. By shifting his judgment and his wrath away from you and me who committed the sin. And put his judgment and his wrath upon Jesus Christ. Because Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. He took our place. I, I should have, we know the old song, I should have been crucified I should have suffered and died I should have died on the cross in disgrace but Jesus my Lord took my place it was I who should have been chastened the judgment of God should have poured out upon me but in propitiation, Jesus Christ stepped over in my place. And he became the substitute for the wrath of God. And because of that, you and I have hope through Jesus Christ. Our sin was shifted to Jesus. And Jesus' righteousness was shifted to us. The theological word here is imputed. Imputed. Righteousness which we did not earn was bestowed upon us so that we could be called the children of God. Standing before God as right and as righteous and as clean and as sinless as Jesus Christ himself. Now that's our relationship. Hear me carefully. I'm about to wrap up. That's our relationship. You know what relationship is? That's kin. Kin. Relationship. We're kin. We're born, born into the family of God. And we're in relationship with the Heavenly Father. We are now called the children of God. God the Father, we're His children. That's relationship. Our relationship doesn't change. Our relationship isn't even based upon our goodness, isn't based upon our merit, isn't based upon our performance. But there's something referred to as fellowship that we have to constantly maintain in our life. Fellowship, fellowship. Fellowship is that state of being whereby we feel, we feel, feel at one with someone. There were times with my parents that I didn't do everything they want me to do. Didn't act in every way they want me to act. Didn't behave in every way they want me to behave. 
There were times I shamed them by my actions. But in relationship, nothing ever changed. Because they're still my parents. I'm still their son. But boy, did our fellowship change. (laughs) Our fellowship sure changed. And, And we had to... You have to maintain that. We had to maintain it. Same with our Heavenly Father. So as I wrap up this morning, I want you to grab this, that that word parakletos, you know, advocate, plus propitiation. The fact that Jesus took our place, that equals perfection. That's what allows us to get into heaven. All that's on the merit of Jesus Christ himself and the gift of his son that we have eternal life. But the fellowship that you're going to enjoy as one of his children, yeah, you're going to have to maintain. And and sin in the life of a Christian is going to break down that fellowship. (laughs) And and, and if you break down that fellowship, let me tell you, you're going to feel like, you're going to feel like your heavenly father doesn't love you sometimes. Now, is that his problem or yours? That's yours. <laughs> Why do you feel that way? Because you've allowed sin to creep in. You're going to feel like God's against you. Who, who, who's usually the cause for that? You are. Because you've got sin in your life. And while your relationship may not have changed, your fellowship has definitely changed. That's why he says, walk in the light. Walk in the truth. As he is in the light, as he is in the truth. And you'll have fellowship with one another. It'll maintain right relationship with each other. And the blood of his son, Jesus Jesus Christ, will cleanse us from all sin. So what do you do when you sin? Well, you know what not to do. Don't cover it up. Don't try to debate with God about it. You say, God, man, yeah, I did that. Confess that. Agree with what God says about it. Confess it. Ask his forgiveness. And you won't restore relationship because the relationship wasn't broken. But you will restore fellowship. And the more you address those issues, the more it gives evidence to yourself Yeah, I really am a child of God. I can't do this stuff and it be okay. I've got to address it in my life. And all God's people said, let me ask you about you, husband, and close your eyes for just a second. Some of you are here in the room. Some of you are watching online. You've never given your heart and life to Jesus, and you're not 100% certain if you died, you'd go to heaven. I want to invite you to a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You, you, you can't self-improve enough to be right with God. You're going to have to come to a Savior. Not who's good, not who's even great, but one who is perfect, sinless, tempted in every way that you and I are tempted, yet without sin. And I want to invite you to call upon Him with me today. Invite Him into your life. Just pray a prayer, something like this. If you sense that tug in your own spirit. Call upon him with me. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Today I turn from sin and I turn to you. And on this day, I invite you into my life to take over. I'm all yours. There are others of you in the room or watching online you've given your life to Jesus you recall that time but you also very clearly aware that there is a broken fellowship down inside of you your walk with God isn't intimate it doesn't feel loving it feels more condemning Jesus didn't come in this world that you might be condemned but that you have eternal life you can turn from that sin 
You can embrace Jesus. You can walk with Christ. You can be mature. You can be consistently growing in your faith. Just be honest with God about your journey, about your sin. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together today studying your word. I pray that these principles, these truths, both of our relationship in Jesus Christ and our fellowship and battle with sin, may we heed the scripture and learn how to master that challenge. Grateful for those who gave their hearts and lives to you today. We rejoice and celebrate along with heaven. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's thank God for his word this morning. Do you have me do that?